welcome. Uh, thank you for hanging in there with us for this um, this whole year. This is our final lecture for the New South Meets Global South lecture series this year. And um, we are really coming full circle. Um, David Gouverneur, who is, who is talking to us today, um, actually taught a studio not long ago with Juanca Cristaldo, who was our first speaker back in September. So if you can remember that far back, um, we're really, you know, um, somewhat unintentionally coming full circle. So, all right, let's get started. Um, David is a professor of practice at the in the Departments of Landscape Architecture and City Planning at the University of Pennsylvania. He received his Master of Architecture and Urban Design from Harvard University and his Bachelor of Architecture from the Universidad Simón Bolivar in Caracas, Venezuela. He was chair of the School of Architecture at Universidad Simón Bolivar as well. Uh, and he was also the director of urban development for the country of Venezuela and co-founder of the Master of Urban Design program at Universidad Metropolitana, where he was also the director of the Mayor's Institute in City Design. His main area of research and pedagogy focuses on informal settlements in the Global South. Thank you very David. much. Nadia, gracias. Uh, very proud and uh, really appreciative for being here. I'm very impressed with the school. Don't be, take anything for granted. The quality of the school and the installations, the studios, the auditoriums, we don't have anything that comes close to it in the University of Pennsylvania. So um, today's presentation, I will try to speak very fast to cover a lot of material. Uh, I had a great uh, dinner with Nadia talking about the program. Uh, things that you're interested, things that you do not tackle. But I think this has a story that is very different of the aspects that were challenging for my generation. I studied four year, 40 years ago. Uh, social justice, environmental justice, uh, um, topics like climate change, sea level rise, remediation, desertification, food shortages, um, violence and terrorism. That was not around when I was a student, but this, you're dealing with these things and that's what's gonna be part of your profession, whether you're your architects, urban designers, landscape architects, or so many. And what I will try to demonstrate is how some of these aspects that are um, close to your heart could be tackled creatively, creating added value through design and multi-scales. That's what the presentation is all about. Okay. Um, so landscape architects. Architecture. I'll give you a little of the context where I usually work and where I take my students almost every semester. Latin America is a highly biodiverse region, uh, like the United States from Canada all the way down to Argentina. It's, it's a great continent, but forces of nature are there and these uh, environments are attacked or threatened by urbanization, illegal mining, uh, grazing, agriculture, and so on. One of the aspects of Latin America is unfortunately, it's still the most unequal um, continent in the planet. Uh, probably the urban uh, poor in Latin America live better than the less affluent in some countries in, in Asia, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh. It's the difference between the haves and the have-nots that creates the conflict. Uh, and of course, a very high percentage of Latin America lives in cities. It's a highly urbanized city. Forces of nature are in action. Earthquakes, tsunami, floods, drought. By the way, the church that you see here in this town in ruins, founded in the early 1500s, is where my Venezuelan parents, grandparents got married, and it was completely destroyed by floods in the year 2000. Uh, with an intensity uh, that the uh, um, experts that analyze the geology, the hydrology, that something of this magnitude had not occurred in over 1,000 years. So climate change is here to stay and it will impact your lives and the way you design. Uh, another interesting thing in, in our continent is that um, we are um, a composite of indigenous population, Spaniards, um, African Latinos, um, immigrations from the Middle East, uh, from Asia. So culturally we're very diverse. And it makes us a sponge that adapts very quickly ideas of other places. And not necessarily we have time 
to analyze if what we are adapting is convenient. What you see on the left is the beautiful historic district of Quito, the first uh, city to be declared a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And what you see on the right is like flying saucer that lands in the midst of agricultural land is a gated community in the beautiful Sabana of Bogota. Okay, so a bit into informality, which is the center of the presentation today. Um, I do not use the English word slums which was introduced by the British in their colonies, in India and other places. Uh, slums it has a very negative, pejorative connotation. Call them informal settlements, uh, self-constructed, organic, uh, young towns, whatever. So there are a lot of pros in this thing. One, uh, the velocity in which the communities build these things cannot be surpassed by any housing agency in Latin America or any place in the world. Second, they grow, they adapt. Uh, so it's not a tiny house. It grows and it's flexible to adapt to family needs. It incorporates shops. So they, these things become living machines. They adapt to topography. This is almost like a fractal organization and they can be very beautiful. Um, they are not sprawling all over the place. They use a compact use of land. All those things seem to be positive attributes. And of course, since they're made by the people, there's a strong sense of belonging and connection in these settlements. Those are the good things. Things are not all that good. They're usually in peripheral locations and they're exactly on the sites that the official plans of the city say that they're not apt for urbanization, which are very steep slopes. Um, floodplains of rivers, sometimes adjacent or on top of landfills or under high power lines. And you can imagine the risks of health and losing properties and lives every time there's a flood or a severe uh, hurricane um, um, or an earthquake. Um, another aspect is that as you see, there's no previous urbanism. You occupy the land, you chisel into the mountain, you delineate, delineate your lot and you start building. So there's not really space for streets, for pedestrian or bike paths, for parks, for schools, all the things that we like and we make cities livable. And of course, when there's difficult accessibility, well, there's especially in Latin America, these uh, neighborhoods under the control of drug lords where the police cannot even enter. Or how if you have an emergency and you have to have take someone to the hospital in an ambulance, how do you get into these neighborhoods where they're mainly only for pedestrians? So that is the, like the dark side of the movie. Okay, when I was national director of city planning in Venezuela, working with um, researchers at their different schools that had dedicated 30 years to research these things, when I was in a class like you, my instructors used to tell me, forget about the informal settlement because they're all built on unstable land. Whatever you do there, you're gonna lose your work and your investment and your time so what we did in the government is that we carried out these studies, for instance, what you see on the left at a regional scale, in which the yellow meant that the neighborhoods are on stable land, maybe incomplete in their urbanism. They are missing accessibility, schools or parks, but whatever is on orange is highly unstable land. It's very difficult to be able to keep the population on those orange things. And we pushed the numbers and we realized that of 1.4 million people that lived in my city, Caracas, in the formal settlements, only 5% were on the orange. That was very different of saying that the entire 1.4 million had to be evicted. And then if we had to improve the conditions in the yellow, we had to relocate another three, four, let's say in total 10%. Now, nobody wants to be relocated. Nobody wants to be sent out of your neighborhoods as we did in the US with urban renewal. So the problem is, where do you relocate the population within the same neighborhood? Those are studies we did at the big macro scale, and then we went in into the surgical landscape, architectural urban design scale for site-specific intervention. Where do we create the park? Where do we do locate the, um, the library and so on, as you see on the right. So these were precursors of the um, plans for the improvement of these settlements. Some images. You don't have to be a genius to see that what's on the left is highly un, uh, unstable geologically land. Um, what you see in the middle uh, is what used to be on the left, that the homes have been relocated 
and keep this image in mind, because as you see, there's improvements in the staircases and the infrastructure, but with working with the community, they have designated the land that previously was occupied by home as community gardens or, or parks or recreation. If you relocate the population from the unstable land and you don't give them a use that is meaningful for the community, they will squat upon the land again, and then you lose your efforts. And then there are interventions to improve infrastructure, lighting, pavement, whatever. It looks almost like a medieval European town. So that's the big difference between that and that. That we did a long time ago. If you guys have the opportunity to study, to travel abroad, go to Medellin, Colombia. Medellin has become the urban landscape and architectural laboratory of Latin America. It was, I don't know if you saw the series Narcos on Netflix. It was considered the drug capital of the world, the most violent city in the planet for many years in the 80s. Now it's a place where people go to marvel of the improvements in these informal settlements. So what do you see, for instance, on the left? Uh, getting from the subway, they have a great subway system, to these communities up in the mountain used to take two, or two hours walking on dangerous trails. Zoom, you fly over the neighborhood in gondola, in ski lifts to make it into the neighborhoods. Of course, to create the station, you have to delete, you have to relocate some homes because you need space to create the station. Or for instance, what you see like the tail of the comet, that green line, it used to be a creek that used to flood every 20 years, killing people. So the homes were relocated there. Uh, then you have this more landscape, and this is a beautiful system of public libraries, world-class public libraries, in the heart of these very poor neighborhoods. That changed completely living conditions. People are proud of staying in these neighborhoods. Are we okay? So far, so good? Okay. Uh, in this image, we see what used to be a polluted creek, uh, where you have already the sewers, uh, you see the clean water, there's a pedestrian promenade, uh, the homes used to turn the back, back to the creek. Uh, here you see that the homes were removed and therefore the remaining homes now look into the creek. Jane Jacobs would say eyes on the city. And what you see on the rear, I'm not going into the architectural quality that could be much better, but those are the relocation homes. So if you don't convince the community that what they're receiving as homes for relocation is better than what they're leaving behind, they would not budge. And if they don't move, then you cannot do the urban design operation. What you see on the right is another of these schools of public libraries, and you see it's full of people. So it's not only the design of the public spaces, the infrastructure, the homes, uh, the communal facilities, it is the management of these things. It is bringing, Sha bringing Shakira to a conference, you know, operating with the theater groups and whatever. So it's a combination of design and good management that made the success. So far, so good. Okay, um, I will say two things. These uh, projects, which are like urban surgery, that you're working in a very delicate way. I know Nadia, you would appreciate this. It's not tabula rasa. It's selecting where you can intervene very carefully to create the gondola, gondola system, the public space, the library, the finding place for the relocation homes within the community. It's very tedious and very time consuming. And sometimes politicians don't have the patience for the technicians to do this work. The other thing is, is that there's a limit of what you can do. For instance, in these very tight neighborhoods, this is again a, an image of my city of Caracas, where the hell do you locate a sport complex here or a large hospital or a transportation system or university? It simply doesn't fit. So there are many of the uses that you could do with the surgical moves at a local scale, but you can't do them at a metropolitan scale. Okay, keep that in mind. And here's where things get interesting. We estimate that all around the world, there are about a billion people that live in self-constructed settlements and all the predictions of the UN and other agencies and that in only 20, 25 years, that population is gonna double reaching 2 billion. So this is no laughing matter. It's a chunk of the world population that lives in this type of settlements. So what do we do? <laughs> do we wait for the settlements to reach this level of densification, of tightness, of consolidation, to apply the surgical techniques that I just described? Or is there a way to plan for the emergence of the other one, one billion people? And that's why I focus my research. Okay. 
I would insist that in most places in the developing world, housing is not really the problem. People know to how to build their home. Look what's going on here. You know, he's going first, second, maybe the third uh, floor. There would be a shop probably there. Look at the level of consolidation. Uh, and they're much bigger and flexible than any public housing. It is the lack of what I call the urban and landscape support system, which is what the communities cannot do on their own. So what does my research, my book, and my practice and work with the students say, uh, and I call them informal armatures, is offer the communities what they cannot can do on their own and foster the growth, the sustainable growth of the communities. I don't know if you know anything, I guess in a, in a, play, in a state like North Carolina, you know about uh, cl clamming and fishing and whatever. How do clams grow? You need a support system. You need the roots of mangroves, for instance, of other, of other trees. And let's say that the clams are these. <laughs> but if you offer a healthy support system, healthy water, clean water and sunlight, then the colony of mollusks, of clams, prosper. It's the same idea. Create a support system and let the clams, <laughs> the individual <laughs> homes, uh, prosper on their own. So, A, I say we can work in a preemptive way. We can work in a multi-scalar because we know that there are aspects that have to do with the local, with the neighborhood scale, but others that have to do with the larger metropolitan scale. I would insist that it's landscape, landscape driven, and this is something very important for designers, Mother Earth is there. You cannot be a good architect, you cannot be an urban designer, you cannot be another good landscape if you're not understanding land, water flows, terrains, how this will be affected with climate change, where's the rich agricultural land, what type of trees you're growing. We went to so many beautiful neighborhoods this morning that you know they were made by the public housing system here in, in Charlotte. And whoa, the, the homes are okay, but the neighborhoods with the trees, with the planting, with the treatment of the landscape could be world-class neighborhoods. And there was social housing, understanding the landscape. Are we okay? We're getting there. Um, the other important thing is that your, my generation, uh, when I graduated from Harvard, they would look at us and they would call us formalists. Formalist is that we were only uh, interested in the beauty, in the aesthetics, in the morphology. Your generation is very interested in advocacy, environmental justice, social justice. How on earth can you address these very serious topics of your generation through design? So there's a combination of the physicality of places and how they perform. How through the good design you help for social encounter and diminishing racial tension. How through good design, you can encourage diversity of the economy in a, pure, in a poor community. How through design, you can reduce the risk of flooding and adapt to climate change and so on. How through design, could you avoid a community from expanding and guzzling the best agricultural land in the city? So it's a combination of using design as a very powerful to tool to address performance. performance. Um, obviously, you focus on the public realm. Look at this beautiful image in Medellin, where it's the design of the public realm, which is the armature, the glue that ties everything together. Another aspect that I would say very important, architects, we try to be control freaks, especially in my generation. We, it's block typology, building typology, room typology, window typology, material typology, everything. And we get very angry when someone changes our project. Huh? They modified the facade, they put an awning, whatever. Um, I would say be focused on what is relevant and let it go in what things that are not relevant. Let people modify, let people intervene. Cities are more important than perfect design. So what is relevant and what is not? I will try to illustrate in the case study. The other interesting thing is that if you can imagine that these settlements are in constant evolution, they're getting taller, they densify, they consolidate, income goes up, expectations changes. So the edifice, the, 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 the buildings are changing. Shouldn't the public realm also change? So the idea is that you have to can you design something that has the ability to change over time? 
I find these topics very interesting for your generation and not uh, a design that cannot mutate, that cannot change, that can adapt. Okay. So we're coming closer. There's a great professor in Columbia University. He's been teaching for 35 years. He's one of my mentors. His name is David Graham Shane. Uh, if you have time, there's a book called Recombinant Urbanism, and the other one is Urban Design Since 1945 for the Future, to the, to the present. He's brilliant. And he says that since Babylonia, the Romans, you have an idea of what urban theory could be, and you think about these things a bit like the concepts that I've been sharing with you, but eventually you find a way to pass these utopian concepts to the ground in physical moves. So if you would say, let's say the Romans, cardum decumanum, the road that goes to Rome and the one that crosses it, and where you have the crossroad, you have the forum. And the Romans would do the same thing, the mercantile, the commercial thing, the bathhouses, whatever. Uh, you go to William Penn in Philadelphia, again, Broad Street, Market Street, you divide it in four, you put four plazas, and in the center where everything meets, you have City Hall. They're models. You go to the Corbusian city, he was worried about the cars separated from the pedestrians. Unfortunately, he introduced the idea of zoning that segregated uses, whatever. But it's a way where an idea, an ideal, passes on to physicality. Well, I came up with my ideas, <laughs> and I invented these th three things. One, corridors that you see are in a more organic way, and they look like branches. It's almost like the support system where you have flows of people, goods, water. That is the the skeleton and the veins that support the city. Then you have these patches. Some of them have dots and some of them do not. Here what I'm saying is these patches where is where the self-constructed processes with the dots take place that cling like the muscles to the support system, to the corridors. And those that do not have dots are the uses that any city would like to have, parks, medical facilities, markets, sport things, universities, technical schools that never occur spontaneously in the informal city. So how can we proceed to make that happen? And finally, the stewards, they're more architectural, architectural institutions that are highly respected by the community that have an area of influence that goes beyond these dots that can operate over the patches and over the corridors. Sorry to go too quick, but I will explain. Let's imagine that you have a neighborhood that is informal on the left. And if we do, don't do anything, in a few years, the entire terrain is covered by informal dots. What is the first thing that our professor, Ian McCard, who taught at Penn for 30 years and wrote a book that you have to read, is called Design with Nature. It's a seminal book published 50 years ago. It was the introduction in the world to ecological urbanism. McCard would say, look into the terrain and map those aspects that must be free from occupation. And what are they? Uh, watershed, <laughs> the creeks, the floodplain, the rich agricultural land, the areas of biodiversity, maybe archeological or religious sites. You map all these things. That's what Ian McCard would do, okay? If we had done that, inshallah, many things would have been very different. By the way, this Ian McCart was called by greedy developers to New Orleans to try to have him vouch for the urbanization of the lower wards that were completely flooded during Katrina. And he showed them the finger, by the way, you know, and they tried to bribe him and whatever. So anyway, that's what McCart would do. Now, if in, you do this type of study in Germany, in the United States, and you deem that those green corridors should not be urbanized, in theory, a developer or um, a family would not move into these corridors because it's legally protected. In the developing world, they would be squatting upon them, upon them the next day. So what does the idea say? Associate these green corridors with uses, as you see here, that can be very simple, but a meaningful for the community. And then this is what will protect community, will protect them if they see if there's some benefit for them by doing so. So far, so good? Contrary, hmm, if we're keeping the um, urbanization out of those green systems, how do we do to attract the population where we want to locate it? So imagine that that pink line 
goes into the existing neighborhood, and there's where you have the end of the transportation or the electricity or the sewer line with the main commercial street. You can assume that you can stretch that energy into the terrain and have people coming close to that, and that in the future, that pink line may be the public transportation system, a bus, a rickshaw, uh, a light rail, and so on. Now, the problem is <laughs> that you cannot build that rail line until you have a population that justifies it, critical mass. But how do you keep that line from being squatted upon and they will never have a good transportation system? What happens if along that spine, you have 300 feet on either side, you fence it and you give it to an agricultural school where in the early stage stages of settlement, the goals is to provide good water and healthy food. When you have the critical mass, you can retain, remove the fence and introduce a system of public spaces and transportation. That's what I'm talking about, transformative urbanism. You're designing a section, a landscape or architectural section that has the ability to accommodate different uses. I find that fascinating. So far, so good. Then, aha, with the support system, then we can have the land that's made available for the self-constructed uh, process. And that can happen many ways. One is copy paste. Guys, you know how to build your homes, do it the same way. What you see here, it looks like Philadelphia. <laughs> it's not, it's informal settlements in Bogota, Colombia. And the reason that is gridded is that in Colombia, they operate with what they call um, private developers. They are people that organize the invasion of the land and say, Nadia, how many friends do you have? <laughs> okay, I have 500 families. You pay me $50, and I assure you a lot. And I threatened the owner of the, of the land to, to give him half of his farm, promising they won't invade the other half. But the, prob the owner of the land goes to City Hall and puts it, gives them a catastrophe record. So what I'm trying to say here that in this particular case, there's a certain pre-design okay, made by a private developer. Use the private developer in Colombia. That's the way they do it. Whereas what Nadia did, taking students to Peru a few years ago in the Prebi project, is what happens there, site and services. That is, you pre-design the organization within the patches. And that is what we see here in experiment done with my students in the University of Pennsylvania, in which we quickly designed the layout of one of these pods, and then we spread them out with um, these uh, wooden sticks and, and whitewash and whatever, defining the public spaces, the lots, and whatever. This is how squatting occurs. Okay, so we're coming to the end of the first part, which has to do with where this comes from, why this type of theory, what type of proposal, the different design elements. What's coming on now is how do you use these things to apply them in different contexts, because each context is different. And then the second part that I want to drive on a zillion times is that you will be a much better designer if you're able to understand the nuances of place and culture. And that has to do with the natural systems, with the urban systems, and with the social cultural landscape. If you really understand what these systems are, then your, your design with the glove would match. You know? And that is something, so in a way, I think I'm a contextualist. And I preach that my students have to be contextualists. You can't apply design solutions without being responsive to the places that you're working on. And that, that needs a little training. And what do we find, and we were, we were into this conversation, that if we have the opportunity to go to a different context within our state, our region, or out of the country, and appreciate how things are different in other places, when we come back to our own context, then we have a different way of thinking to appreciate, and we don't take things for granted in places that are more familiar to us. So I think this is very important in education to move out of the context that we're familiar with, you know, and start reading these nuances, whether they're natural, cultural, or urban. Okay, I think we're back. <laughs> Yay, thank you. Okay, and by the way, of the components that I did not mention are the stewards. Imagine that that little dot under the purple line is at the edge between what could be urbanized and flood uh, lands or valuable agricultural land. 
Okay, again, in developing countries, if you zone them, that will not hold the city from expanding onto that. What if that circle there is a church, a school, an agricultural school, and you fence 100 feet around the school and we tell them, you have stewardship of this thing. Put in violent dogs, I don't know, keep them out, okay? If you have that band under the control of a respected institution, uh, you're diminishing the opportunity that that city would spill over to the rest of the site. So they're tricks. This is what we did in Colombia. Like for instance, what you see there, uh, you will, it was the, the library was not inaugurated yet and the trees are just starting to grow. On the right, it's a beautiful public library and we gave them custody of the land that used to be a former prison. No one would dare occupy that park because it's under the custody, under the surveillance, under the stewardship of the library. Okay, so those are the stewards. And all these things work like a network of components that are in constant transformation. That's what I find so beautiful about this. Okay, some interesting things we go, before we go into the example. One, for this to happen, there has to be political support. In my age, they told me, don't worry about upgrading informal settlements. Now, in most developing country, the upgrading of these uh, settlements with the techniques I showed you is accepted. What is not accepted is that you plan for informality. They will tell you you're inciting something that is illegal. Well, I mean, <laughs> if they cannot enter the formal housing project, none of you guys can get a mortgage without a job or savings. Well, people that come from the countryside to the city don't have savings, don't have formal jobs. They have to squat. If you don't provide land in a safe place with the urban and landscape arbiters, they're going to end up in the floodplain and you're going to have a social time, time bomb, bomb down the line. So you need political support. Uh, by the way, this is the former mayor of Medellin. He was one of the best mathematicians uh, in Colombia. His father, sister, grandfather were all architects and planners. So he had a mathematician mind, but with the insight of a designer. And he is the uh, wrote the prologue of the book that I'm leaving you in the library. So I hope you, you enjoy this. Okay, uh, what else? Uh, you have to assemble public land because what does assemble public land mean? It's a subsidy. If not, they will end up squatting what they're not supposed to. And eventually you have to spend more money to provide the infrastructure, the accessibility. So how do you assemble public land? Or you buy it, Nadia, you wanna sell me your farm? No, I don't want to sell it because it comes from my grandmother. Okay, I have another option. I will apply eminent domain and I'll pay you in 20 years. I think you will consider my option. I have even one, a better one. We negotiate. I will provide infrastructure. I will create the park. I will build the school that creates added value. You keep, I put in the light rail and you give me half of the farm and sell it to me for $1. And I'll give you zoning to build 50 stories. Are we okay? Maybe Nadia will accept. Oy. It's here, at least. Okay, so some questions of, uh, until now. We go into the examples. Break the ice. Yes. of this our author, of David Graham Shane. It is recombinant urbanism and urban design since 1945 to the present. David Graham Shane. He is originally from the UK. He studied in the AA in London. Then he came and did his master's and doctorate at Cornell University with another very interesting author. The book is quite old but it's still a seminal book. It's called Collage City of Colin Rowe. Collage City, Colin Rowe. And in a way, these two books of recombinant urbanism and the uh, urban design since 1945, they are like an, off, an offspring of Collage City. Oops. Um, 
Yes, please. Let's try to take advantage of this. Of this. Okay. The the other thing to maybe simplify things is that before we go to the examples, I threw some images of how we operate. I mean, the students work with this theory, with the book, and then we select sites. We usually go in the last year, uh, one semester that is this, I'm always confused, this is the spring, we are working in, usually in Latin America and in the fall in Africa. Um, I was speaking with your professors that one of the great things that we do, I mean, the tuition is so high at Penn, but one of the free things that the students get is the free travel abroad. We get about between $1,000 and $1,400 per person in the two last semesters. And that allows to organize these offshore trips, which are fascinating. The other interesting things is the following. Let's say that this semester we're working in Panama, last semester was in Kenya. And a, what we do is before we go, let's say in week number three or no, week number four, we do site analysis, understanding the natural systems, the urban systems, and the social cultural systems. And as you do, we go into the internet, the libraries, or whatever, we get a lot of information. But one of the things that we've discovered that is, yay, yeah. that is great, is that you guys use your computer screen day and night, or the iPhone. The only problem with that is that even if you're working with middle boards and you're working online with other colleagues, the board is that big. The screen is very small. And therefore, the urban context is compressed. If you want to zoom in, you focus on something, but you see the detail, but you lose the big picture. And that could be a problem. So what do we do? We plot plans that are 25, 30 feet big, wide. Huge plans. Of course, we use the 36-inch plotter, and then we collate the maps. And we create these huge plans that you can walk on. We usually take our shoes off. And, and in these huge plans, you can see every single street, creek, house, mass of vegetation, uh, where the schools are located, where the tramway is. You can read the land. And that is so important. OK, can I continue? Hmm. Hold on. Uh, I think we have to go click here. And after we click here, Aha, uh -huh. so getting to know the context. Okay, so for instance, this was in the Dominican Republic a few years ago in a former banana plant plantation that was operated by the Americans. So we analyzed history, what it was, the abandoned company town. These were the barracks of the workers. Now very, very low income families live, 10 families in these tiny huts. Uh, these are the abandoned industrial things rich ecosystems, mangroves, rivers, national parks, and so on. We know that the government, this is in the border with Haiti. If you follow the news, Haiti is almost a failed state now. So the government is trying, A, to build a wall a la Trump. Hmm? Two, a, they, <laughs> they're trying to turn the defunct port of the banana into a big international port to send containers through the Panama Canal and to the U.S., and they want to build a um, power plant next to the mangroves, whoa, with very severe ecological impact. This is some of what's going on now. That's the construction of the wall. Deforestation for the power plant is already an ecological disaster. And these are some of the huge maps that we do in the studio where we start analyzing things before we go to the site. We visit the site. This is a community meeting. And what is great about this is that in the huge maps, with these yellow, with these sticky notes, we play a game. The good, the bad, and the possible. And the people say, the good, our plaza, our park, the sport facility, the base, great baseball players, our beach, the bad, huh? half of the town floods, half of the town doesn't have running water. Um, 200 families are living in these barracks that came from the banana plantation and so on. If you could dream a better city, what would you like to happen? see happen? They say, 
oh, there's going to be a big port, but we're not qualified in port operations. There's going to be a big power plant. We have no idea how we can become workers of technicians of the power plant. We need a training center and so on. We need better water facilities. Based on this conversation with the community, during a one or two day charrette, we start producing the big vision, which you see here. I don't want to go into much detail, but what you see is the place of the port, the place uh, of the containers for the port, and then you see that green thing, it's just we're trying to reconnect the mangrove system and the coastal system, which is now segmented by the existing banana, old banana port that is killing the mangroves. So all this happens during the field trip. Again, you apply the concept, you know, the accessibility armatures, the protector armatures, water management armatures, and then eventually these things become the type of plants that you're familiarized with. At a more urban scale, which is this, look, or we zoom in to that, and here we clearly see the recycling for the new housing areas, where you see on the left, um, the mangrove system that is weaving, giving ecological continuity, the location of the new port, eh, and that is still an intermediate stage. And then we go to the final part of the semester where we're reaching an urban design and a more architectural scale. So notice between the insinuation of the housing development with a pedestrian spine in the middle, this is already shaping up in how these clusters of homes are occurring and what happens with the recycling of the old industrial warehouses. And then we start going in into design of these things and the quality of the landscape in the residential area. And then what can happen in the recycling and the landscape of the industrial thing. Now, so this is planting, it's water management. Um, it's uh, what do you do with the all abandoned drums where you had oil or where you had water and so on. Uh, how do you rehabilitate the mangroves, uh, filter the polluted waters, and so on. Okay, so that's a bit like the technique of dealing with the big maps that, by the way, are hand-drawn until we go digital. So it's a hybrid. You see that I'm combining formal with informal, hand-drawn with digital. No, I think I really believe in these hybrid techniques. Um, this is another case study in Guatemala. Uh, what you see here on the left, is all informal settlements that where the population squatted upon 10, five, and they're still squatting. And you see that agriculture is not usually random. Agriculture has a parameters of metric, is gridded. So what you see there that look like blocks, they are blocks now, but they squatted upon the agricultural grid. What you see on the right, they're all gated communities of middle class two different social groups that don't interact. And what you see in the middle, <laughs> dividing them, is a very large agricultural school. Uh, it's uh, like an agricultural campus where mm, we spoke with the director of the campus and about 20% of the land is under production and the rest of the land is underutilized. So applying the techniques, uh, here you see some images but you see at the lower left is the informal settlement, quite consolidated up to three, four stories. What you see in the left at the middle are the gated communities. What you see on the right is the only small road. And then you have the wall that divides the road from the um, agricultural school. Applying the concept, you have a green corridor uh, where you capture the water coming from the agricultural areas. Agriculture, you always use nutrients. The nutrients have to be filtered. If not, they end up in the creeks, polluting the creeks. Then the second image implies how you can create, keeping the agro park in operation, how can you create these green bands that link the two different income groups? The idea that you're bringing social groups together. And finally, on the left or on the right, there are these patches that allow for mixed use development some of them self-constructed, some of them middle class, and you're creating a healthy relation between the urban areas and the agro park. So this is diagrams. How do you go from a diagram to this? And when you look at this, I think at least it's quite pleasing to the eye, you understand that the general organization of the agricultural bands is what's <laughs> filtering in the organization of the streets, the pedestrian corridors, the urban fabric. I think the images speak for themselves. 
This is still uh, intermediate scale or big master plan. Uh, if you're interested in landscape architecture, you go into the details of what these bands are with agriculture, sport facilities, water management, pedestrian paths, whatever, where you locate the market. Um, this is the self-constructed on the left. Uh, this is very similar to what your students saw in Peru with Nadia. And here what you have is, uh, this looks very Philadelphia, if you've been in Philadelphia. You have a narrow street there, you have about 300 feet, another uh, vehicular street uh, that crossed the park. And then between one and the other, you have a system of pedestrian walkways that nurture like these small villages. This is very Philadelphia, which is the, this gray, uh, gray. And then what you have are these lots for self-constructed, organized with community gardens in these clusters. And then you have community gardens in the public space in the main pedestrian spine. Now, why does it make sense to have community gardens here? Many reasons. The population that has migrated here come from agricultural areas in Guatemala. Two, it's very fertile agricultural land that if you don't protect part of it, it all will be gone. And three, because you have the big agricultural school as a steward next to them. So you have many reasons why it makes sense to introduce agriculture in this particular condition. And then you can go into those that so landscape architects, they select the species, they know what grows fast, what is in the culinary diet, what can produce uh, an accident in the production that you can sell in the market and you sell it in the market and then you design the architecture of the markets where you're supposed to be locating and so on. And then as we started in the area centered in the agricultural school, there's a vision of the entire district, which is the fastest growing metropolitan area in all Central America. Are we okay? Again, I'm addressing these is issues of multi-scalar design that go from big territorial armatures to urban armatures to site-specific and in some cases, architectural response. Are we okay? I hope this thing interests you. If it doesn't study chemical engineering, nothing wrong against, <laughs> nothing against chemical engineering. Okay, let's change context. Are there any particular questions of the two case studies that you've seen? Bam. Puerto Rico, USA, a little beautiful island uh, that lives of tourism. They used to live of a thriving um, pharmaceutical industry. They changed the taxation role, uh, laws. All the uh, pharmaceutical industry disappeared in 10 years. Uh, that is in, in, induced uh, another exodus of Puerto Ricans to, uh, to the United States. They have American passports sprawling patterns in a tiny, tiny uh, um, island. Okay, vulnerability. Every couple of years, the Caribbean, well, and we know that in this region also, we're hit by hurricanes. The hurricanes are getting worse. What happened with the last hurricanes? It revealed how vulnerable the infrastructure was, especially the road connectivity and the power grid. The other crazy thing is that by laws of Congress, since FDR time, everything that's imported and exported to the island of Puerto Rico has to go through an American uh, company, whether it's by air or by ship. It's crazy. 80% um, of the food in Puerto Rico is important, imported, and they have some of the highest obesity rates in the US. Okay, so how can you use the studio to envision a less vulnerable and dependent Puerto Rico? We work not in a dense metropolitan area because attending uh, less dense, more rural communities is important. It's called Toa Baja. Nice beaches, some remains of the colonial past, whether it was the farms run by the Spaniards or the Spanish forts. Uh, I guess you all know what Levittown is. It was the first embryo of suburbs that sprung all around the United States, built in the 1950s. The first occurred in Long Island, New York. The second levy towns occurred in Levittown, Pennsylvania, about 45 minutes out of Philadelphia. And this is one of the third or fourth levy towns with the same pattern. Um, what do we see here? A, <laughs> uh, we, I went through some of the communities here this morning, um, and I was rather impressed that most of the original homes looked like the original homes. But Latinos were a bit, mm. <laughs> so all the homes that were built all the same, A, we took over all the land, all the mm, uh, setbacks. 
uh, for the grandmother, for the expanded family, whatever, we personalize the homes. So these are the original suburban homes that have turned into this. But that is not the problem. The problem is the image that you see in the upper right. In normal rainy season, it floods. And when there's a hurricane, they're eight feet under water. In this area, uh, aerial view, you see a few things. A, this is Levittown. And then you see smaller patches of uh, red, informal, 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 and informal. And the reason that these are not continuous is that they're in higher grounds because everything that is in blue in between floods. And why does it flood? The biggest river in Puerto Rico is on the left, next to the historic district of the 1700s. Water falls on former dead sugarcane plantations in the middle, and then you have the impact of the surge during a hurricane, and it's going to be worse on sea level rise. You can't design for a place like this without being responsive to flooding and sea level rise and water management. Are we okay? So how do you respond to that? Hmm. The first thing that you see here is green infrastructure. That is all these lines. I wish I could blow up these things. And here's where the computer really works. All these things are topo lines where on the left-hand side, you're creating elevations and crevices that hold the water. You retain the water. This was a technique that was introduced by uh, the Dutch. It's called Room for the River. They're using it in New Orleans where they had a connection with the Dutch after Katrina, by the way. Um, what you see in the middle that looks like a lake is excavations that allow to draw the water from the agricultural fields so it will not inundate the agricultural areas and so on. What is interesting about this thing is that you are dealing with water management, but obviously, for instance, that orange line that you see next to the river, it's a berm that protects the river from flooding the town. The berm becomes a system of bike lanes and mm, promenades where you can walk in the municipality that's full of these beautiful, um, the beach, the mangroves, the um, historic remains, and they're trying to market the municipality as an area of ecotourism. What I'm trying to say with this, if you have with certain moves that you can address different processes as flooding, flood control, tourism, public space, agricultural services, and you're combining these um, outcomes with simple design moves, you're creating added value through your design. That's the message here. Again, you go from a big image, we selected a few pilot sites, keep in mind the two on the left and one maybe lower down. I start with the two on the left. The historic district in the far left next to the river. What is in green is a defunct nursery. All this is the abandoned sugarcane uh, land, a little informal settlement where the floods usually occur. Existing, again, the diagrams of water management, of connect, uh, connectivity, and so on, still at the level of the diagram. We make models, uh, we simulate the flooding. This is with sand models and pouring water and whatever. And here you start seeing that this white line is the highest point of elevation, is the berm that keeps the river from eventually flooding the historic district. And that is where, you see it in the sand model here, is where the bike lane goes. Still at this level of models, you start zooming in, look what's happening on the left, bang, and you then you zoom in. And here you see the berm with the bike and pedestrian promenade. You see the existing plaza, you see the church. This is an interesting case study in all Spanish uh, America, from San Francisco all the way down to Argentina, you have the plaza and the church looks at the plaza because you come out to the church and you socialize in the plaza. This thing is turned its back to the plaza. Why? The original town was founded on this side until a flood <laughs> destroyed the town in the late 1700s, and they refounded the town behind it. The only thing that did not collapse was the church. So here we're creating a smaller ecological plaza that faces the new berm and the flood control system. By the way, all those trees that you see there, they're there, you're working with them. You're not destroying them. You're working with nature. Again, a bird's eye view. Then we zoom in and we go to the 
quality. This is all done with gravel. It's not hard surfaces. Why is this done with gravel? A, it's cheap. B, it allows for infiltration to the aquifer. aquifer. Three, the heat is not bouncing back on a hard, a hard surface, but it's much cooler. And then with very simple design, you're creating a very meaningful place. Some of the existing trees, these are some of the suggested planted trees that bloom at certain time of the year. So you study the botany and whatever. This is the existing um, defunct um, nursery. Um, these patches of dock that you see there are royal palms. The nursery proper for the vegetables were in the middle that you see like those triations. The royal palm is very beautiful, but you can't uh, for landscape mm, decoration if you want, but it doesn't produce fiber. You, it doesn't produce coconuts. You can't eat it, whatever. It's just a beautiful, a beautiful uh, palm. But anyway, okay, existing proposed. We're keeping obviously these trees, you can thin them. That is, you take every second or third palm, you take it away, you plant them in other areas of the city, you bring back to life the nursery, you create a better edge condition because now the informal settlement turns its back. There was a number of homes that were destroyed in the last uh, um, hurricane. Where what you see in the background behind the, um, the market is a new row of homes that look to the nursery, and then you're locating the market close to the road where the products of the nursery that are operated by the community can be sold for the greater market of the city, and so on. This, remember the area where you had like the lakes of flood control? The students discovered that this type of palm that is called moriche, it grows on wetlands in the big rivers of Latin America, in the Amazon, in the Orinoco, in Venezuela. And this palm is used by the indigenous population to produce fiber for, market, for hammocks. It produces flour. Uh, it's an amazing plant and it thrives on wetland. So you're again trying to deal with flood control and with a planting that tries to produce economic, diversify the local economy. I, get, I think you're getting the message. By the way, in the rehab of the nursery, the students introduce tropical flowers. You can imagine the amount of flowers that are sold in, uh, in, in, that are placed in the hotel industry in Puerto Rico. All the flowers come from Colombia. They're shipped to Miami, and then they're shipped to Puerto Rico when they could be growing their own flowers on the island in an amazing tropical uh, climate. Are we okay? Bomb. This was not in the flatlands, but in the hills. The problem here is that the homes uh, would, um, started um, going down with the, with, the, with the heavy rains. Uh, there were landslides. There were about 80 to 90 families to be relocated. And we discovered that between the highway and that main road, there was that yellow patch there which was municipal public land. We did not have to buy it, negotiate it, apply eminent domain, and it was occupied by defunct, um, a cemetery of former bosses, municipal bosses. This is crazy. You have people living in the hills that are crumbling, and then below them, you have municipal land under your lies with derelict bosses. So the proposal of relocation, these are the, some of the homes, the roofs were replaced temporarily by FEMA, again, a pedestrian spine, the mobility spine, the location of the new homes. I guess you're getting the idea, the general concept. There's higher density when you come to the road. There's lower density. Uh, these are two beautiful hills that exist. Look at the topo at either side. Uh, the pedestrian spine goes in the middle. The vehicular goes at the edge. And then you have the views onto the two uh, mountains uh, with these bands of uh, row houses. Again, the bigger view, you go more into an architectural image. There was something very beautiful here. The largest landfill of the metropolitan area of San Juan of two and a half million people was in this municipality. It uh, was being closed down because it reached capacity to be relocated within the same municipality in a rather modern, advanced, high standard recycling center. Take the recycling center and use it for the imagine manufacturing school that we place in the plaza. And I think you're getting the idea. The quality of the spine, the quality of the residential areas. These are the public spaces. These are the backyards. 
And then as you go up in the terrain, then you have an outdoor amphitheater with the local plants and so on. Okay. Closing. Again, the importance of working with the community, getting their ideas, engaging with them, giving validation to your general ideas. You work in interdisciplinary groups and intercultural groups, not only with your colleagues of the University of North Carolina, but with students from the, with community members, developers, and you share your ideas, you come up with the quick ideas, you make it all by hand, you present it very quickly, all this is by hand, and then of course, then you do what you guys know how to do. You go into the digital world, and then you're working systemically. Uh, this was very beautiful. Uh, this is a creek that floods, and all the homes were in the floodplain. They were densified on either side, and so on. I think. Work by hand before going into the computer. That's it. Thanks for your patience. Gracias. Hey, have a look at this. My English is not that great now. It was not that great. It was worse when I wrote the book. Um, now there's a Spanish version and there's some with new case studies for those that speak Spanish. Uh, can you approach me? I can somehow send you the book. Uh, it's a uh, Mandarin version. It's appearing in China in a very different context. Uh, where, as you know, every country is different. In China, we have a more top-down uh, political system and many of the settlements are being demolished and people are being forced to high rises miles away from where they live. You know, I couldn't write in that terms, <laughs> accusing the you know, Chinese government uh, that are publishing my book, telling them that they're nuts. But I, I had to say it in a nice way. The importance of preserving the, se the settlements because they're the depositories of thousands of years of Chinese culture. They also have been in the land for thousands of years, and then they know how the rivers behave, how the ecology behaves, so they're stewards of the landscape and so on. So every culture has different nuances. And um, that's the type of work I think I do and I love to do. Fantastic. Thank you, David. David, sorry. <laughs> um, let's see. So we have a little bit of time for questions and answers. OK, way, way in the back. I will try to get there. Hi, my name is India and I'm a fourth year. And my question is in the context of where urban redevelopment and urban development is influenced by private interests, how do you navigate the complexities of balancing community needs with the interest, the interest of private stakeholders? And what strategies do you employ that ensure development of those initiatives and prioritize public good? Good, brilliant question. Um, to answer, I will have to refer you to one of my best friends. Unfortunately, when we were having lunch, he is originally, his name is Ken Greenberg. Um, he was originally from New York and he fled to Canada to flee, uh, not to fall in the draft of the Vietnam War. And he eventually became a very good friend of one of the great authors of urbanism, uh, Jane Jacobs. And of course, Jane Jacobs books you must read. And he called me that his well, wife just passed away today. It's interesting, but I would refer to him. Um, Ken operates mainly, he's worked in, uh, in, in St. Louis, uh, in other American cities, in Puerto Rico, but mainly in Canada. If you guys have been to Toronto, it's become one of the mega cities of the American continent. It used to be a sleepy post-industrial town only five, 10 years ago. So how does Ken uh, operate to address your concerns? Well, in a way, what I'm doing with the students, he brings the different urban actors into a room that represent the diversity of different interests in the cities. Developers, community leaders, uh, representatives of the city halls, uh, ecologists, you name it. 
So it varies. Sometimes it's of the uh, educational area, sport facilities, whatever, uh, the business, the chamber of commerce, whatever. And he brings them into a room with tables with the same map in different tables. And he says, okay, why don't we get organized in groups of affinity? So all the developers are there at the same time and maybe somebody at the city hall that is uh, in charge of applying the codes and negotiating the codes with the developers. But then you have the communities that feel that they are affected. Or you have the ecologists that are against everybody. <laughs> they don't want the communities there. They don't want the developers. They want to protect the, the, the swamp and the, the wetlands and the birds. And at the same scale, they indicate what they want. You know, so let's give an idea. The developer wants to build a mall and the mall is full of parking lots and it has quick access to the highway and so on. And the ecologist is saying, no, continuity of the green system, the wetlands, we can't chip them up because if we cut up ecologies, they die and so on. And they work for about three hours, all on the same scale, on the same different maps. Guys, have a good lunch, we'll see you in three hours. During the three hours, Greenberg analyzes the different positions and overlays the things and sees where the moments of conflict occur. And that's where design intelligence come in. Mm. So you would say, whoa, here I have a problem. There's gonna be a big fight here because the mall is stepping over the wetlands of the ecologists. But this guy has not realized that the city has a plan for a light rail. And the light rail is gonna give further accessibility and we're gonna have a pedestrian mall leading to the thing. And when you push the numbers, we can have half of the parking lot below grade and not in the surface. By moving the mall, you know, 400 feet to the left. And that's how he starts working with the different pieces of the puzzle. When he comes back and shows the thing, the conflicts are reduced to 10%. What I'm trying to say is that you're always gonna have different positions. But if you have clever design and you don't leave it just for a city code that is fixed, that is, you know what, uh, 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 mm, somebody that works for the city hall has to obey the code, you know, because that's the law. You know, if not, he goes or she goes to jail. But if you have a plan that tries to bring the different interests together, you reduce conflict in a high percentage, and then you produce a plan and you produce a code. So that's the other thing is that one thing is to say, oh, well, I want to protect the ecology, and the other one say, well, but listen, I have a critical size. I need 200 units. If not, a housing project of five stories with an elevator would not work in Charlotte. Okay, so you know, you're dealing with 300 units or 200 units and whatever. So there are certain rules are very, but if you are able with the design solution to show that there's an option and there's room for negotiation, and maybe you give it a little way, but you show it in the plan and not just talking, then you start solving conflict in a different way. If you leave it, if you want to build a wall and I'm the ecologist, you know, each one is going to defend their agenda. But the plan itself, the design itself, allows to solve many of the issues. And that's what I try to explain uh, here. So that would be my answer. A bit elliptical, but I think that's a good way to operate. Good question. Very good question. OK, somebody else. All right, come over here. Hi, my name is Joseph. I'm a first year student. Uh, my question is, in your projects, have you seen, and this is definitely in America, I know it's in other countries too, uh, you're talking about like class divide. Have you seen that like middle class or upper class people are kind of ref refusing or don't want to use public transit? Um, I mean, we can definitely see that in Charlotte. Like if everyone wanted to use public transit, our light rail system would be filled to the brim during rush hour. It isn't. Um, and we even see that on campus with like when it rains, there are some people who get their friends to drive them to classes instead of using our bus system. Mm -hmm. So do you see that in your projects? And is there a way you see of overcoming that either with policy or with design? Okay, good. Um, first of all, obviously there are cultural biases in every city, in every place, in every district. And A, these cultural biases sometimes change. Like if you had done planning, 25 years ago in Charlotte or in any city, 
you had unfortunately unfortunate uh, uh, um, uh, expression of white flight uh middle class and upper middle class families were leaving downtown and were going to the suburbs obviously there's a new generation that wants to live closer to the city so there's already a different trend you guys are the ecological generation i mean you believe in walking you believe in biking uh, you believe in social integration. I mean, there's an army, despite the divisions in our country, there's an army of people that are uh, thinking differently. So biases change. The other aspect is that I think, I tell the students sometimes, you have to trick people into things that they don't know that they're doing through good design. And for instance, let's take the example of Guatemala. These two groups that really the, the, the racial and the economic, more than racial is economic dis discrimination is so, well, the problem is that to get out of this place, that little road that you saw there was taken on a Sunday morning. If I took an image of that road in a work day, they leave at six in the morning to make it two hours later to downtown. And what were we proposing that they not explain there was expanding the road that we were able to do it because it was government land, the school, and we were including a BRT that led to the last uh, station of the Metro, which is under construction now. So obviously, <laughs> when this thing goes into operation, instead of losing two hours, four hours a day in traffic, it's gonna take 25 minutes to make it to Central Ciudad de Guatemala. So we know that that's gonna change the behavior. So there, where we have the BRT, that would connect to the Metro is we have a station of the BRT that is located on one of these bands that crosses from one side to the other. And what is the trick on the band? We know that are things that in Guatemala bring people together whether they like it or not. They have a great agricultural base. The carrots are that big without fertilizers. Where you locate a market, rich and poor are going to, they're not going to the supermarket, they're going to the popular market. Uh, salsa, music, Sports and religion, okay? They don't play baseball, they play soccer, okay? So where we place these things, we know that people are gonna come together. That's another way of tricking people into what they don't usually do. So design has the power, the good power of tricking people. You're not lying, you're tricking people, you know, and that's what happens. Um, in my country, uh, it was the, before Venezuela disintegrated with a so-called socialist revolution, it was the seventh economy in the world, uh, the two countries in the 1950s that had highways in the American continent, interstates, were the U.S. and Venezuela, the cheapest gas in the world. We are in a little city compressed by mountains the size of Manhattan, three million people compressed by mountains, and super highways a la L.A. running in the middle, when the, uh, and the nightmares of traffic were until they built the subway. And they would say, nobody's going to run a subway, okay? Rich and poor are the option or you're three hours in a traffic jam, or you're 20 minutes in a beautiful subway, and the subway was built with a huge system of public spaces in the surface. Immediately, it changed the mentality of the city. So again, I believe that design can change biases, and you could trick them into doing things that they normally would not do. Doesn't solve everything, but... Thank you. So. Okay, others. Perhaps you guys have been quiet. Okay, all right. Yeah, before before you answer, you know, one of my biggest moments of frustration are with these academic uh, projects that we think that we're doing things well. I mean, we're engaging with the context. We're not going like experts that know everything, but say we have a vision, we've seen how it's done other places, we're working with you guys, we work very fast, we give this work pro bono, by the way, so it's very quick, you know, a, we're working with city officials, and then I would say that if 20 to 15 percent of the ideas survive, it's hyper success, because the political follow-up is crazy low. Politicians are into something very different. You know, unless you get a brilliant politician like this math teacher in Medellin, or you get a brilliant architect, uh, if you Google the city Curitiba, 
C U R I T I B A. Curitiba, Brazil, is one of the urban and ecological references in Latin America, in Brazil. A total transformation into an eco city in 20 years where everybody uses the light rail. And why did this transformation happen? Because the mayor of 15 years and then became governor of the state was an architect and city planner. Okay, so you didn't convince, had to convince the head of government, of local government, that design made a difference. Okay, so that's another thing. How do we develop the skills to permeate the political segment? I think that is one of the most frustrating things because many times the developers agree, the communities agree, and it's the follow-up at a political level that sometimes, so I would encourage you guys to study political science and run for council members with your design skills. Sorry, I think there was a question. Hey, hey, my name is Daniel. I'm a first year student. Uh, first of all, I wanna say that I really appreciate your lecture. I think I have learned a lot. Uh, I'm from Colombia. I was born and raised there. I moved here just two years ago. And I, I'm like so proud of my country that they have been like implementing these type of strategies to like uh, kind of like change the political situation and kind of like change the history background that we have in these kind of places. And um, my question is, uh, how can we like address or what strategies, strategies they are to implement or like supply the needs for the minor minorities, communities that can like, they, they don't really have like a voice or sometimes they're like forgotten by the government. So how can we as architects in a small scales, we can implement like some type of design solutions that we can make in affordable way for this type of minor minor communities, if wow. that makes sense. Okay. What, what, what area was your family from? Were you born there or? Yeah, I was born and raised. In what there. city? In Bogota. In Bogota, Cachaco. Muy bien, Rolo, very good. Um, okay, it's a very uh, complicated question. So. First, again, it has to do with the political will, but also with discovering the opportunities where change can occur. Let me um, go back to the case of Medellin. Uh, we were, my students of the University of Pennsylvania were the first international group that went to Medellin when it had the stigma of being so violent that nobody went to Medellin, and it was. It, and we had the opportunity to work with this guy that eventually wrote the prologue, Fajardo, who was mayor, governor, and presidential candidate of Colombia. And when he received our students, put us in the room in his mayor's office, and he said, I am a professor. I like to lecture. I like to interact with my students. And this is my head city planner, which is a very good friend of mine, Mr. Echeverri. He then became fellow at Harvard. He has won a zillion awards. During the entire week, you would be with my, your, your colleague that speaks the same language of design and planning. But I would like to address your students to the political vision. It started there. He says, this is what we thought had to happen in this city of violence, extreme violence, exclusion, lack of economic opportunities because no one is gonna invite, invest in a city where they're killing themselves in the streets day, day and night. So he started addressing the political vision. So that is one thing uh, going back. You, if you have the possibility of tapping someone that has political interest and sensibility in an area, that is the first battle that you win. He said, if there had not been a political vision, forget about the technical vision that followed. And what did he say? He used GIS and he said, show me in Medellin, which are the most the poorest, excluded and violent neighborhoods in the city. And they mapped it in green. And it happened that the dark green was the very wealthy areas. And then the very light green, almost faded, almost white, where were the high uh, the crime rates? And where were they? Low income, in the periphery, no accessibility, no schools, no hospitals, all the indicators uh, where the main drug law gangs operated. What did the guy said, say? For the three years of my mandate, which is nothing in Colombia, at that time, now there's re-election. At that time, there was no immediate re-election. He said, I'm gonna forget about the rest of the city. 
The rest of the city, it's more or less rolling. I'm going to invest my political capital, money, technical teams working for these few communities and gain trust and make a difference. So that's the first thing I would say, if you have the possibility to engage with. I'll give you another way in which you operate. Um, this next semester, I'm going to Senegal, to Dakar, a big city, two and a half million people. And the city is 80% informal and it's growing. It's going to have 5 million people in only 20 years. When you look at the map of Dakar, this thing is expanding onto very fragile wetlands where they have flamingos and whatever. And you know that all the sewers of all these elements are going into. So it's an ecological disaster, but people have to live. Well, what are our contacts? I have a brilliant um, doctoral student from Leventhal from New Jersey, when he was 18, went with um, the Peace Corps to Senegal and lived not even in a city, but in a hut. He's still friendly with his Senegalese brother. I'm trying to say that at some moment, this person was interested in these communities. And 20 years later, he still has contacts with this country that received him and with the family and with the university and with community leaders. He was the one that said, we have to run their uh, studio in Senegal. And I got a grant and we got funding from two departments to go. The next move is in which communities can we operate to demonstrate that the type of planning and design that brings together community needs with so, uh, environmental um, protection can be done. So it was the wisdom of selecting the sites where we know, knew that was A, community organizations, and that we had more malleability. We didn't take the densest neighborhoods that are built on top, but we took the areas that are growing into the wetlands where there's still space for change. We know that that's going to be a, a, a model of things that can be done because up to now, the urban design plans don't even acknowledge that 80% of the population lives in the informal. They operate like if they were living in a rich country dealing with zoning codes. And the schools, the professionals, and the bureaucracy is dealing with a fragment of the population and not with the rest. So again, I'm giving you elliptical answers, but these are two ways of, or you tackle at the top, or you discover case studies where you can help, you know, and demonstrate through pilot projects that uh, our change is different and that you can gain credibility with the politicians, the technicians, and the, and, the, and the communities. Going back to the Medellin, I go another example. Um, usually in city halls, you have divisions, housing, transportation, culture, sports, whatever, a zillion things. Usually the divisions in City Hall work in silos, you no, know, and you have different directions and they don't communicate. These projects need interdisciplinary work. So what did they do in Medellin? This famous mayor that you saw the picture there. We have to get things done in three years. One year to identify the projects, one year to design them and build them, and one year to operate them. Okay? And in order to do that, all my municipal agencies have to be working in a network, connected. Uh, um, the director of the housing division, whatever, he's been in the job for 22 years. He's bored to death. He thinks he's uh, the boss in the area. Ah, you don't want to co collaborate horizontally? I'll outsource your position. He bypassed the guy. Two, <laughs> one thing is having the municipality working this way. The other thing is with people your age working in the barrios in Colombia that got get to know the drug dealer, the community leader, the priest, and everybody. So while they were designing the projects, these young people were creating the network that made things happen in the neighborhood. And as the projects were being developed, the young coordinators in the barrios would go to the council meetings with the mayors and would say, with due respect, you know, we've been waiting for the materials of the sewer division for one month. The project is falling behind schedule. So what I'm trying to say, that's just another example where you're working at a high level, you're working with the communities, and you're breaking the bureaucracy. That's another way of doing it. So, I mean, there's so many ways to address what you're saying that uh, I think that is to have the wisdom of contacting the right people, whether it's a political or the community, selecting the projects that have more possibility of succeeding and creating credibility in a short time, that is another one. Let me go back to Colombia. 
if you speak with the city planners, they would say you go from the big thing, and I almost did it today, to the small scale. The, this mayor in Colombia said, by the time you finish the big scheme, uh, scheme and you go to the small scheme, I'm not mayor anymore. You select some projects that we get done in the communities. Don't lose the big vision, but you get those um, five libraries built next to the gondolas that are gonna change the way every behave. And we start creating the public spaces between the gondola station and the library. And we deliver that in the first year. We get credibility, we get support, the community starts reacting. Then we can go and start interconnecting and the bigger and whatever. Now they're redoing the entire uh, Rio, the river that runs between the two highways, like in, in so many American cities. And it's the entire scale of the city. But they started at projects that could be done in short time with credibility and so on. Again, another elliptical answer. Thank you. Muy orgulloso de tu país. <laughs> Very proud of this country. Let's see. Okay. I, I think we are about at time. Yes. All right. So, muchas gracias. Profesora, gracias, profesor. Thank you. Okay. Guys. Yes.